Welcome to the Parent Guide to GCSE podcast and today's episode is with Dr Mark King who is the admissions tutor for Lucy Cavendish College at Cambridge University and he's going to be talking to us about all the information about how to apply to Cambridge University and Oxford uh, and the process you can expect to go through as a student. Um, Because there's so much information we're going to do it over two parts so this is part one. Okay, good morning, Dr. Mark King. Uh, Welcome and thank you very much for joining us. If you could uh, start off by just explaining um, what you do. Yeah, hi, thanks very much for having me. My name is Mark King. I'm the admissions director here at Lucy Cavendish College, one of the colleges of the University of Cambridge. So what that means is that basically I run the college's admissions procedures for both undergraduate and postgraduate students. I'm the first person to read all of the applications that we get through. I interview applicants in a wide range of subjects, and I also chair the selection meetings where the final decisions about applicants to the college are made. Um, I work with colleagues in similar roles across the entire university also to set university admissions policy at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. Oh, wow. Okay, so you're quite busy at the moment then, one would Yeah, just, just a little bit, yeah. Uh, and just for the benefit of the tape, I mean, we are recording this uh, in the COVID times. Mm-hmm. Not that that necessarily changes too much about the actual applications coming in, but I dare say visits to universities are difficult. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So at the moment, we, as a university, as a college, we do an awful lot of outreach and recruitment events. Um, those are currently solely virtual, unfortunately. Um, we, we're in a position where central university policy is now that we're unfortunately not able to do in-person events, probably until the new calendar year. That's, that's what we're looking at. Um, and that's been, the, that's been the situation for a number of months now, unfortunately. Um, but we're really proactive. We're doing an awful lot, as I say, of virtual events in the meantime. We had a week of virtual open days last week. Um, and yeah, if, you, you know, if you're interested in, in seeing more, have a look at the websites of some of the Cambridge colleges and you'll find that everybody is running all sorts of sessions over the summer, opportunities for you to engage with academics in the university, opportunities for you to talk to admissions professionals like myself, about applying to the university, all sorts of different things. Okay, so interesting about the outreach work. I mean, uh, my take on it would be, if you want to go to Oxford or Cambridge, why do you have to sell what you offer? Because surely a lot of people, you, you're, um, the number of people applying must be obviously way in advance of the number of places eventually offered. Why do you, as Oxford or Cambridge, why do you need to advertise? It's definitely true that we get a relatively high number of applicants per place. Although interestingly, actually, as a university, we don't get as many applicants per place as a number of other top Russell groups. So, for example, somewhere like Imperial College London gets more applications per place than Oxford and Cambridge typically do. And I think that there are various reasons for this. One of the reasons is because our offer levels are so high. You do have to achieve very high grades in your A-levels or equivalent exams in order to be able to come here. And I think for some people that puts them off. I think some people kind of price themselves out of the market almost and assume that they might not quite get our grades. Therefore, they don't bother to consider us, but they will look at other really great Russell Group universities. Um, I think more generally, and this is where the outreach comes in, there is a problem of, of perception here. And there remains this kind of lingering sense that Cambridge and Oxford are universities for a very particular kind of person. And that that person is not just, you know, someone who's academically very talented, really loves their subject, but maybe that they come from a particular background or a particular social class or something like that. And that's what the outreach work is really designed to address. Because yes, we do get a good number of applicants per place at the moment, but we would like more applications. We are, we we're very aware that there are a large number of very talented students out there who come from a whole range of diverse backgrounds who are actively choosing at the moment not to apply to the university for a whole host of reasons. And we want to encourage and support them to consider Cambridge and Oxford alongside their other choices and really to see themselves as what they are, as prospective Oxbridge students, to recognise that their talent and their academic ability is what we are after and that in this day and age you absolutely do not have to be a particular kind of person or come from a particular kind of background in order to be able to apply successfully to one of our universities. I think at this point I mean obviously we're very grateful for your time it's only right that we give you the opportunity to uh, a shout out to your particular college because I know that in terms of um, the students you're trying to attract this year 
um, things have changed quite a lot from last, or as they always have been, I guess. Do you want yeah. to just tell us a bit about that? Absolutely, yeah, thanks. Um, so the college I work for is Lucy Cavendish College which probably actually is a college that most people haven't heard of. They've heard of a lot of the older, um, more established colleges in the centre of the city. But Lucy Cavendish is at the moment a smaller women's college on the outskirts of the kind of centre of town. Um, and we were founded in the mid 20th century with a very particular purpose. At the time that Lucy Cavendish was founded, still relatively few women went to university and relatively few women went to Cambridge. So we were founded as a, as a college for mature women. So this is women who are aged 21 and over. And the whole purpose was basically to provide opportunities for these then underrepresented students to come and study at the university. So if you like, we were in a way one of the first kind of WP colleges of the University of Cambridge. And that's very much in our DNA and it's, and it's remained our mission ever since. But in recent years, we've realized that our mission needs to change or it needs to be updated to make it fit for the 21st century. And so our new admissions policy, which takes effect from this year, is now to be open to students of all ages and all genders, just like every other college of the university. Um, but particularly, we want to focus on underrepresented and disadvantaged students. So we have two very, very specific aims. We're looking to treble our intake of undergraduate students over the next few years, but in doing so, we want to ensure that a majority of our students actually come from underrepresented or disadvantaged backgrounds. And over time, what we're seeking to do is to build an undergraduate student community here in the college, which actually represents UK society. So the kind of demographics that you'd see across the entire country are reflected in our student body. And if we're successful in this, we think, we think this would make us to be the first Cambridge College which has ever actually achieved these two things, really opening up access to the university, providing these places specifically for students who are currently underrepresented and looking to bring them in and support them. And, and if I can, I'll, I'll kind of talk a little bit as well about how, how we see this working for our students overall and what, and what our focus is. The, the other thing that we do, which is a little bit different, I would say, is that as a, as a college, we're very aware that students, they, they want to come here for the education that we offer, but they also want to make sure that that education is actually going to lead somewhere, particularly for students from many of our new target backgrounds. You know, we're aware that this really matters, that they want to do, to do degrees that they know ultimately at the end of the day are going to get them a job, a good job, um, and are going to set them up for their future careers. And I think in the past, there has been this kind of sense that, that Cambridge has, has focused very much on education for education's sake. And that's, and that's good and proper in many cases. But as a college, we recognise that it's also important to make sure that our students are then prepared for the future and that they're able to go on to make this progression, as I say. So we run two really specific programmes here, which are designed to try and help this, that sort of situate what we're doing within, if you like, the wider cycle of someone's education and then their career. So the first program is called a bridging program. All of our new undergraduate students sit this program. They come to the university normally about a week early before our first term begins, and they go through what is effectively a university preparation program. It initiates them into the university. It helps them to understand um, how different things work here. You know, from the basics, you know, where your faculty is, where you actually go every day for your lectures and things like that, all the way through to how the various different systems work and what our teaching methods here are. This thing that I'll talk about later called supervision, what that is, how that works, what you'd experience. And they meet people like their personal tutor, they meet their director of studies, again, people whose, whose roles I'll talk about a bit later when we talk about the benefits of an Oxbridge education. And it just helps them kind of to make that transition to university. We do a little bit of academic skills training as well, help students think about things like overall essay writing skills, the kind of things that they're going to need on a weekly basis whilst they're here with us. So bridging is designed for sort of that end, if you like, helping you to make that transition from school to university. And then whilst you're with us, we have an extensive careers program as well, which is unique to our college. We've got a number of people at our college who are great for this. The director of the university careers service is one of our fellows in college. Um, and we've got a number of people as well who are heavily involved with the judge business school. 
So we run these kind of enterprise style events where students have the opportunity to find out more about all sorts of different careers, to meet with various different alumni of the college, um, find out about the sort of things that they do and get, you know, everything from skills development through to careers, mentoring, interview training, all sorts of different things that we build into this package that then is designed to really help students to make the next jump. So we've helped you sort of initiate yourself into the university and then whilst we're, you're here, we support you to think about what you're going to do ultimately with your education after you leave us and indeed hopefully to make that transition to your desired career. And as I say, this is, this is how we see things now as a college, right? It's about situating what we do within your wider education and careers life cycle. Okay. That's, um, coming back to the point you made earlier about, um, uh, was it uh, Imperial College London? So. Mm -hmm they get a huge number of applicants more so uh, than you do per, um, per student, as it were. Um, what would you say to people looking at um, those sorts of Russell Group universities? Why would, you know, what is the benefit of an Oxbridge education compared to one of these other sort of prestigious um, Russell Group universities? Yeah, sure. So I, I think one thing to address, first of all, perhaps with, with particularly some of the London universities, um, and I see this a lot when I go into, into schools in London. Um, there, there is obviously a sense that, you know, if you're, if you're a student living in London and you want to keep your costs as low as possible, why would you bother to go to Oxford or Cambridge when you could go to Imperial or UCL or King's and you could potentially live from home, keep those costs absolutely as low as possible and still go to a world-class university? And I understand that. And I think people living near to other fantastic Russell groups think the same. Um, so absolutely, it's you say, what, what are the benefits of Oxbridge? Why, why consider us? I think there are three key things, really, that separate Oxford and Cambridge, even from the rest of the Russell Group, as, as fantastic as those institutions are. The first is our education. So every Russell Group university can boast of having world-class academics, and that's obviously no less true at Oxford and Cambridge. You know, we, we really do have world leaders in every single field of the academic subjects. Whatever it is that you want to study, you can guarantee that you'll be being taught by an absolute expert in that field during your time here. But crucially, what, what I think is different is the way in which we actually teach our students. So it's still the case that at most universities, your teaching is based largely on lectures and then on things like classes and seminars, you know? So methods of teaching, which, which ultimately are not that dissimilar in a way from what, what you might already have received at school. Um, increasingly, however, a lot of Russell groups are starting to try to bring in more small group teaching. They understand that what students really want is the ability, to, the opportunity to engage directly with these world class academics. And at Oxford and Cambridge, we have always done this. At Cambridge, we call the system supervisions. At Oxford, they call them tutorials, but they're exactly the same thing. What they are is weekly small group teaching sessions. And at Oxbridge, by small group, I mean one, two, three or four students, absolute maximum. That's what we're talking about here. So as a student at Cambridge, for example, every week of your time here, you would have at least one supervision. And this would be, as I say, with a group of up to probably three or four students. But in a lot of cases, particularly for the arts and humanities subjects, um, actually it's still one-on-one -on -one teaching a lot of the time. So you would go to your supervisor. This is an academic from within the university who's been selected to teach you based on whatever it is you're studying that term. Um, as I say, there will be an absolute expert in this. And you would go to the supervisor and every week they would give you work to do. You go away, you do that work. It might be a reading list and then, you know, you produce an essay for them or it might be a kind of problem sheet for a science degree, something like that. All sorts of different things it could be. You submit the work to your supervisor the night before the supervision and what the supervisor then does is effectively they draw you up a personalized lesson based entirely on your own work so you go in and you have this unique teaching session where everything is tailored to what you've studied that week and indeed is based on feedback to your own specific work and so if you think about kind of the benefits of this you know if you've if you've struggled that week that's absolutely fine. Your supervisor can kind of take a step back with you and just help you to build your way through the supervision, developing your understanding as you go and making sure that by the end of your time together, you know, you really do understand um, and you're absolutely in a position to go on to next week's work. 
But equally, if, it, if it's apparent to the supervisor that you've really mastered this topic this week, you know, you're in complete command of it, that doesn't mean that we cancel the supervision or something. Instead, the supervision is an opportunity then to be completely flexible and to develop all sorts of different ideas, go off on whichever tangents you find interesting, you know. It, it's that ability to respond directly to our students' needs and indeed their, their studies. Um, that really sets supervisions apart. And it's, it's something that you can only do when you have such small numbers of students engaging with an academic at any one time to provide that kind of personalization and flexibility. Um, and just, just to clarify, I think, I mean, most universities, uh, you will have probably a, a tutor, I guess. You will uh, have and, a that, tutor. and that would tend to be a sort of once a month meeting, uh, fairly yeah. ad hoc rather than a absolutely once a week with a specific agenda it will vary from from university to university absolutely yeah so so um yeah and i i think that's that's one of the differences but uh, but as i say having uh, as you quite rightly say paul fixing this in in this way and 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 making it a, a permanent fixture of i mean you know it's the foundation of how we teach here at cambridge everything that you do as part of your degree course um, you will be supervised on at some point. Everything that's ever going to come up in an examination, you will have been supervised on at some point. So having that that, potent, that ability to, to go directly to the academic, have an individual specific conversation about this, as I say, where you express your understanding and they help you to develop that at whatever level it, it presently is, that really is unique. So think about it from a, from a general education perspective, right? Think it, Imagine you're in a GCSE class or you're in an A-level class or something. The equivalent would be taking everybody else out of the room and it's just one student and the teacher. And the teacher is just there to teach that student and to make sure that they understand and that they're absolutely going to flourish in their examinations. That, that's what we offer here. That's what sets, if you like, the Oxbridge education apart, even from the rest of the Russell Group, the fantastic institutions that they are. So that's, that's one thing which I think is really important. Second thing, um, which which differentiates us is our collegiate system. So this confuses students an awful lot. Um, Oxford and Cambridge are broken down into different colleges. Easiest way to think about this is to think of the university as being like a school and each college as being kind of a schoolhouse, if you like. Um, so wh why does this benefit students? Well, again, it helps them, I think, to make the transition to university. A lot of major universities, campus universities, city universities that students might go to, they're going to move in as one of a new year group of thousands of students. And in a way, that's how the university is going to know them. You know, When you come to Oxford or Cambridge, you become a member of one of these colleges. You're going to live in this college. It's kind of like a hall of residence, but if you took that idea almost to its to its kind of logical conclusion. So you move in as part of a bunch of maybe a couple of hundred students instead, rather than a couple of thousand students. And within your college, that means that you immediately mix and meet with people and you get to know people. And this kind of forms the basis for you then going out into the rest of the university, meeting more people, making more friends. But it also means that within the college, you've got people, staff members of the college, who are able to support you, with whom you'll form the kind of personal professional relationships that you need so that you know who you can go to if you require support at any point during your time there. So I mentioned a couple of these people earlier. Director of Studies and Tutor are the two most important ones. Your Director of Studies is an academic within your college. They're kind of, if you like, the head of the subject within your college. And they're a member of the faculty as well as being a member of the college. And they act as that kind of link between college and faculty. So what they will do is they will act as your, as your personal guide, if you like, through the Cambridge courses. They'll help you to choose which options are right for you. They'll make all of the arrangements for your supervisions for those small group teaching sessions, making sure that you're sent to the right person for those. And they, they may indeed be one of your supervisors at some point. And they'll meet with you on a really regular basis to be constantly sort of checking in, you know, academically. How are things going? Are you on top of the work? Are you enjoying the course? Are you choosing the right options that are for you, et cetera? If you have any academic problems at all, your director of studies then steps into action and they work to support you. And that might involve reducing your workload temporarily. It might be working with your supervisor to think about different ways to support you. All sorts of different things we can do depending upon your circumstances. Do any people, yeah. um, do, do people actually drop out of um, Oxbridge universities halfway through? Is it? Is there a... It's incredibly rare. 
so we've got we've got one of the lowest dropout rates in the country and the reason for that is is partially i think because of this student support because you know that you have as i say this person who you can go to and talk to if you're struggling um academically then that's that's a real advantage and then the tutor is somebody else who you can go to. So you also, you have this director of studies who, if you like, is kind of the academic support person. But then you also have a pastoral support person, a broader support person, who is your personal tutor. They're also an academic within the college, but they're deliberately not taken from your subject area. So you've got no kind of qualms about ever going to them. And the role of the tutor is, again, just to support you. Like your director of studies, they meet you regularly, they check how everything's going. But the tutor is someone who you know you could go to if you're encountering any other kind of difficulties. So if you're encountering financial difficulties, health difficulties, mental health difficulties, all the sort of things that, that we know come up all the time and that yeah, absolutely do beset university students because university can be a stressful time for a lot of people. We know that, that's why the tutor's here. And the tutor is there, as I say, to support you through this. Um, whatever it is that's happening to you, your tutor's got the capacity to put you on basically a program of personalised support. Hmm. Well, that it does might sound, be yeah, it sounds very uh, comprehensive. Yeah. Um, just a quick question from uh, my point of view. Um, mm -hmm. If you apply to Cambridge or Oxford, do you apply to the university or do you apply to the college? So you apply, you apply to the college. It, technically... It works slightly differently at Oxford and at Cambridge, but broadly speaking, what, what you're doing is you're applying to a college. The colleges make the admissions decisions on behalf of the university. So at Cambridge, you apply directly to a college on your UCAS form. You indicate which college you want to be a member of, and that college then receives your application, processes it, deals with it, makes the initial decision on it. At Oxford, slight difference, you express a college preference, um, and that college kind of deals with your application in the first instance, but it might also, excuse me, it might also be considered by other colleges. Um, and at both universities, you can do what's called an open application, where you don't express any college preference. Um, and then what will happen basically is your application will be randomly allocated to one of the colleges instead. Which is um, the best? Which is the best route, from your opinion? There's no advantage or disadvantage. A, a competitive student is going to be competitive regardless of whether they put in an open application or they apply to a college. People, um, people often get a bit caught up on this and they, they sometimes try to game the system. You know, People will look at the, at the figures for each college and they'll try and work out, oh, that one gets fewer applicants for my subject, so I'll go for that one. But actually in practice, a lot of the time, what happens is that the applications to each college and for different subjects tend to do this on an annual basis and fluctuate because a lot of people try to play this game. So you'll find that it varies a little bit. Um, but overall, we can guarantee you that your, your chance of being accepted by the university is not affected by your college choice. And the reason for this is that both universities, we have um, applicant reallocation, basically. Um, we call it the pool. Um, because what it effectively involves is taking your applications and putting them in a kind of virtual pool that allows other colleges to see them and to select them from that pool to take them out to make offers to if we want to. So as a college, what, what we basically do is we receive our applicants, we process them, um, we interview them, etc. We get to the decision making point and we will choose to make offers to a certain number of those applicants. We will choose, unfortunately, to reject a certain number of those applicants, but then there will be a third group, and that's students who we think absolutely deserve a place at the university, who have definitely demonstrated the sort of things that we're looking for, but for whatever reason at the college, we're not able to take them this year. We might, maybe we've got too many good applicants in one particular subject, with a bit of overflow, whatever it could be. Those are the students that we pull. So we make your application available at that stage for other colleges to consider. And the pool is something that every college takes part in. Every college puts students in, every college takes students out. Um, on average, roughly one in four Cambridge students ends up at a different college to the one that they originally applied to because they've been pulled. It's not a bad thing, it's the system working. This is how we ensure it's fair and balanced. So if you do end up going for a subject in a college that's really heavily oversubscribed, it's okay. Your application will still have the opportunity to be considered by other colleges if the college you've applied to thinks that it deserves that. You always kind of get that, that backup option, if you like. Okay, so, and, and those left in the pool, once all the colleges have done their bit, they, they will have essentially be rejected 
Um, yeah, unfortunately, those then those then will be rejected. There, there are certain mechanisms that work as well. So one thing that then happens at that stage is we have what's called open offers. Um, so that's where these are particularly for students from um, widening participation backgrounds. We identify at that stage as a university any students who we think have maybe missed out and who we would like to consider. And what can happen then is the colleges can choose to underwrite these students for what's called an open offer. So as a student receiving this, you receive your offer from the university at that stage, not a college. And you won't know which college you're going to end up at until your offer is actually confirmed in the autumn. But it does guarantee you a place. It basically guarantees that if you do meet the terms of your offer, a college absolutely will accept you. It's just not necessarily certain which one it will be at that stage. Um, and then the other option, of course, is that now Cambridge, at least, participates in adjustment. Um, and adjustment offers a fantastic opportunity for students who've applied to the university, been interviewed, um, but then haven't been successful in getting an offer to be reconsidered in August if they've met or exceeded the terms of the offer that we would have set them. So there are all sorts of different mechanisms that we're really building into this process to try and make it as fair as possible and to try particularly, I think, um, for, for underrepresented or disadvantaged students to build in these extra opportunities for them to be considered at various different stages to make sure that nobody can really fly under the radar, if you like, and miss out on a place that they absolutely do deserve. What percentage of students actually meet their offer in the end? And that varies from year to year um, and it varies across um, different groups of students. So um, A-level students versus international students, etc. It, it will vary a little bit. On the whole, our cover ratios are not very high. We're not making an awful lot more offers than we have places available. Um, we tend to be, to be sort of quite tight with that. Um, we do only have a fixed number of places available. You know, ultimately what determines the number of places that a college can make available is the number of rooms that it actually has in the college. Because again, one of the, one of the advantages of the college system at Cambridge is that you will live in your college for the duration of your time with us. Um, and that means that, you know, you never actually have to go out into the private rental market in the city, for example. But it does mean that we can only admit as many students as we have bedrooms available physically in the building, you know. So it's a, it's a fairly fixed um, number. So we're only, we're working on pretty narrow cover ratios to make sure that, you know, we, we fill our places, um, but we're not over offering in the way that some universities are because we, we have this commitment to making sure that we house our students. And we wouldn't ever want to be in a position of actually bringing in more students than, than we can physically house. So if, uh, for example, an offer is made um, for uh, economics and mm -hmm. uh, the offer is, is it always AAA? How does it work? What's the, is there an average? Is there a... Yeah, so two, there are two standard offers, right? So, so Cambridge, um, the standard offer for science and maths courses and economics um, is A star, A star, A at A level. Um, for arts and humanities courses, and also for our psychological and behavioral sciences course, which is kind of on the borderline between arts and humanities um, and science and maths, and indeed actually also for our veterinary medicine course, um, the offer is A star, A, A. So that's the, that's the range that you're looking at. Typically, you're always going to be asked to achieve either one A star and two A's or two A stars and an A. Now, colleges have discretion in offer making. So colleges can set steeper offers if they want to. Colleges can um, you know, choose, for example, to attach an A star grade to a particular subject or indeed to attach two A star grades to particular subjects. So common, for instance, let's say you're applying for maths at the university, well, um, to, to apply for maths at Cambridge, you have to be doing both maths A level and further maths A level. And typically, an offer for mathematics is A star further maths, A star regular maths, and then A in a third A level subject. Um, and also for maths, we have, we have our own mathematics admissions examination called the STEP examinations, and we'll set certain grades that you have to achieve in those. Um, but it, it, so in practice, you know, things can vary. And yes, there will be circumstances where a student might be made a 3A star offer. It has happened. It can happen. Um, but broadly speaking, the, the range is, is, is there. It's at the top end of the, of the A star grades. And it's, and it's a fairly narrow range of the kind of offers that we tend to make. So uh, with a course where the offer is um, A star, A star, A, and the student misses out and only gets an A star only, gets an A star and two A's. Yeah. Is that an automatic rejection? What's the process on results day? Yeah, so we, we then have basically another round of pooling. 
Um, so what we do every year is we take the students who are what we would call near misses, like the, like the, the example that you've just given, um, and they go through another round of consideration. They'll, they'll in the first instance be considered again by their own college, right? The college is not just going to automatically reject out of hand anybody who narrowly misses. We'll look at the circumstances. It might be that, um, you know, the school or the student has sent in some information which relates to extenuating circumstances. Fine, we take that into consideration, et cetera. Um, we look at our overall picture as a college, how many of our students have met their offer this year, how many of them haven't. Um, and so we make that kind of initial decision. But then there is also the opportunity for students to be uh, to be considered again for a second round of pooling that we call the summer pool. So we take those who are near misses, but who we have decided as a college that we are not going um, actually to, to keep on the books, if you like, and we make them available to other colleges again for consideration, because it may well be the case that colleges are in a position where quite a few of their offer holders have missed, and they're looking to pick up a few more students at that point, and they're perfectly willing to consider someone um, who, you know, only very narrowly missed and who all the other evidence suggests they've absolutely got the potential to do well at the university. So what's the mechanism with results then? How, how, how long before the results come out to students do colleges, do your colleges get that information? Typically, so A-level is only on Thursday. Typically, we receive, we receive the results on the Monday. Um, it can happen over the previous weekend, which tends to ruin admissions directors' weekends. Um, but <laughs> I, I, Yeah, I thought it was only 24 hours, but that gives you a bit no, more time to make no, it. No, it's a little bit more time, yeah. So, we, so we're in a position of being able to make decisions. Now, at that point, we're under a UCAS embargo, so we're not allowed to, to talk, if you like, to applicants, schools, parents, anybody about the information we've received. If, if student, we, we understand that students are probably anxious and they want to know, but if offer holders get in touch, unfortunately, at that stage, we basically have to say, we can't say anything to you now, we'll talk to you on Thursday. Um, so yeah, so, we, so this is why, for example, um, students might find when they log into UCAS, on Thursday morning, you know, bright and early, whatever, they want to check their results, um, they might find that they've missed, but they've already been accepted still by their first choice university. That's because the university will have had that information at the start of the week, and it may already have made the decision, we're going to take this person anyway, right? We're not too worried about the narrowness of the miss or something. Um, for those who are then going through pooling, summer pooling at, at Cambridge, um, that process tends to take place on the Thursday and the Friday. So we, it tends to be the case that what we're saying to students at that stage is, um, we, we understand how concerned you are about this, we're doing everything we can for you, give us 24 hours and we'll be in touch to let you know what the outcome has been. So going on to the actual application process. So mm -hmm. you've, uh, as a student, you've looked at your GCSEs, you've uh, made the inquiries, you phoned the admissions office just to sort of you know, speak to them and clarify a few things. And you're going to make, uh, you've decided to make an application. Where does it start and how does it work? Okay. So all UK university applications run through UCAS, right? Um, you have to apply online through UCAS to, to all UK universities, and you can apply to up to five um, in one UCAS application in one year. Um, the UCAS program opens in normally kind of early September every year, and it runs all the way through normally until kind of mid to late January when it typically closes. Um, but for Oxford and Cambridge, and indeed also for medicine, and for veterinary medicine at any university, and I think also for dentistry, um, you have to apply earlier. You have to apply by the deadline of the 15th of October every year. That deadline never changes. So what that means is if you're, if you're looking at these kind of universities or, or those kind of courses at other universities, you basically have to be a bit ahead of the game here, right? It's, it's not really, I think, a good idea to, to only start thinking about this at the end of year 12, beginning of year 13. I think you wanna be thinking about this through year 12 um, engaging with the universities, doing a bit of preparation, and then really starting maybe to work on that application at the end of year 12 and over the, over the summer. You know, and schools typically support people to do this. This is why typically schools start people writing personal statements at the end of year 12. Um, so you fill in the UCAS form, it's an online form, um, it collects all sorts of different information about you from your qualifications through your personal situation, etc. Um, and then that goes off to the universities. And it also has a personal statement section on it. And we'll, I think we're going to talk about those in a minute. Um, once the, the UCAS application is received by the universities, the universities will then put it through their individual process. 
And at Oxford and Cambridge, we have a really quite specific and um, a little bit more detailed process than other universities do. So we get these applications in. At Cambridge, the first thing that we then do is we immediately send you another form. Indeed, we might send you several forms, actually, depending upon how many, which college you've applied to. Um, but we have a set form that's called the SAQ, or Supplementary Application Questionnaire. This is another digital online form. Um, and we email you the link to it and you log in and you can complete it in multiple sessions if you want to. This is basically an information capture device. It's not assessed in the way that your UCAS application is. It's just trying to gather more information about you to help us to see your application in context. Because I've already mentioned this is really important to us. We want to understand everybody's individual circumstances so that we fully understand that application and are able to situate it in an appropriate context. Is, is this essentially a, the personal statement doesn't give you enough information to make? Much. Yeah, the, the UCAS form in general doesn't give us enough information. So the SAQ asks things, for example, like, you know, how many students are in your A-level classes? Because actually, that's important, right? It's not fair to assume that somebody who's in an A-level class of, say, 25 has had the same educational experience as somebody who's in an A-level class of four. They've obviously had different access to the teacher, etc. Yeah? Um, the SAQ gives you an opportunity to talk about any um, courses that you wanted to take, but you weren't able to take. It gives you an opportunity to, to basically tell us anything else you want us to know to help us to understand your application, be that teaching difficulties, be it whatever. Um, and, and crucially, um, this is where you complete the SAQ yourself. Your school doesn't actually see what you put on it. So you can more or less use that to tell us anything that you think we should know. It also gives you an opportunity to write um, an additional little kind of addendum to your personal statement, um, which is only seen by Cambridge. So that's useful if you're applying for one of our courses, like the natural sciences course that I've already mentioned, which is a bit different from other universities. You know, you might have written a physics personal statement because you're applying for physics at every other university, but because you're applying for natural sciences at our university, because that's how we do physics, um, you can use the SAQ personal statement to talk about why you like our course and, and the flexibility that gives you don't have to put that in the main personal statement that goes to, to all of your other choices too. Um, so that's the SAQ. So we gather all of that additional information. And then also um, for some subjects, what you will then do is you will sit a pre-interview admissions assessment. So Oxford still has these for most subjects. At Cambridge, we have them mainly for um, science subjects. So we have them for medicine, we have BMAT for medicine. Um, we have them for natural sciences. We have them for engineering. We have them for computer science and for economics and possibly one or two more. Um, so if you're applying for those subjects and you can find out online which ones exactly it is, you will sit this pre-interview assessment. You'll sit it in school or in a registered testing centre, just like you would do any other examination. And your school or your college will register you for it when they actually submit your UCAS application. We send all of the stuff to them, you sit this assessment, and then that data comes back to us. And then at that point, we make an initial selection decision, a kind of shortlisting decision, if you like. We decide which of our applicants we're going to continue on to the interview stage of the process, and which, unfortunately, we're going to reject at this point. Now, at Cambridge, it's a relatively small proportion of applicants that we reject at this point. Typically, we take about 75 to 80% of all of our applicants through to interview. So it's a pretty small number of people. Um, who actually get rejected at this stage. And, and generally, it's students where the, the whole application um, suggests to us that this person is unfortunately very unlikely to meet the terms of an offer if we were actually one day to set them an offer. Yeah? So this is, this is about just slightly narrowing down the field and focusing on those who we do think have, have got the potential to, to achieve the sort of grades that we would ask them to get. Yeah? There's never one thing that will that will lead a student to, to end up being rejected at that stage. You know, it's where everything from, from GCSE results to predicted grades, teacher reference, pre-interview examination performance, personal statement, all of it, the entire package suggests that unfortunately, this is probably very unlikely to be a, a successful application. Yeah. At Oxford, with each application, when it comes onto your desk, mm -hmm. um, is it something that you consider or is it done as a team exercise? So I, I read, uh, as, as admissions director, I read them all. Um, 
and and then what happens is I work with my subject specialists so I work with my directors of studies and other fellows in the college to shortlist so what, what we'll be doing is we'll be sending um, you know the English director of studies for example will see all of the information about all of the English applicants as will my broader team of English selection fellows within the college yeah? and then we work together um, to, to decide which students we're going to shortlist and which students we're unfortunately going to reject at that stage. So with the deadline being 15th of October, yep. um, obviously with the supplementary questionnaire uh, and other bits that you need, when do the uh, interview offers go out? How long between the 15th of October and that uh, offer? Yeah. Does it go? So a, a little bit later. So typically, the, the, as you say, UKS deadline is 15th of October. SAQ deadline is normally around 20th, 24th of November. Um, and then students normally, for the subjects that have them, they normally sit a pre-interview assessment um, at either at the very end of October, 30th, 31st, or at the very beginning of November. Um, and then what we would normally do is we would normally be sending out um, interview invitations probably in kind of the penultimate week of November, if we can do. Interviews typically take place in the first fortnight of December. Um, so we, we try where we possibly can to give people at least a fortnight's notice um, of, of their invite to interview. Things are gonna be a little bit different this year for, for COVID reasons, and that's something we can talk about at the end if you want to. Um, but, but broadly, in most years, that's how the, the timetable works. So we've got a pretty, it is a pretty narrow window, right? You're, you're working flat out from the moment the applications come in up until kind of mid-November to be making these shortlisting decisions. I'm just out of interest, you know, Lucy Cavendish, how many places do you have every, every intake? Yeah, so our new undergraduate intake, the, the standard age or gender intake is going to be about 130. 30 places um, and that's uh, within Cambridge colleges that's towards the the kind of the larger end Cambridge colleges typically I think most colleges are around about kind of 90 to 120 places available um, and then you have got a few who are a little bit bigger than that right for the time being thank you very much Mark we are going to pause there because you've got so much information that we can um, give to our listeners, we're going to do it over a two-parter, rather than having it as one hour and a half long interview. So thank you for the moment, and uh, part two will follow whenever people want to click on it. Thank you very much.